Hello, everybody. How are we all doing? Hello. Hello. Oh, good. Doing great. Okay. Um, so before we get started, hold on, I have to find the statement I'm supposed to read. Uh, hello, everyone. Just a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and posted to YouTube shortly after. Your participation in these meetings is an agreement to abide by the Cloud Native Security Code of Conduct, which can be found in the repo. I need at least one person to volunteer as scribe to ensure all actions and primary content discussed is recorded in the written notes and may be referred to later. Who is willing? I can do that. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Marco. Um, for existing members and working group reps, please remember to include your organization company along with the working group you're involved in, uh, involved with in the update. Um, and looks to me like uh, someone is kindly going and uh, creating the new template for this week's meeting as we speak. Yeah, Great. I'm doing Thank that. You. Perfect. Okay. And um, so be sure to go through here and put your name and um, uh, any project uh, related stuff um, that you have. And also, if you have an update, um, feel free to mention it. Um, we do have a really exciting um, presentation that's going to be the primary focus of this meeting um, that I, and I'm going to butcher your name. I'm sorry, but is it Filio? It's just Tilo. Tilo. Okay. No worries. That Thank Tilo um, will be giving in a bit. Uh, we'll probably do a little bit of other um, just kind of housekeeping stuff first and then uh, have Tilo go ahead and jump into an interesting discussion about black car. So, um, okay. So I hope everyone is taking a moment to add themselves and their affiliation and things like that to the notes. I will post a link to the notes in the chat here or Marco already beat me to it. That's great. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, Great. And um, so uh, going down the list, um, do we have any new members who'd like to introduce themselves? Okay. Uh, hearing none. Um, so uh, I don't think we're going to be going and doing much of a triage of current issues. Um, Andreas has gone through and commented on like over 100 of the tag security issues and closed a bunch of them and stuff. So there's been a tremendous amount of work in that area. Um, a lot of that is mostly based cleaning out old things that exist uh, rather than um, like um, massive amounts of uh, shovel digging work uh, in a lot of areas, but he also did quite a bit of shovel digging work in quite a few areas and has uh, helped to clean a lot of that up. So uh, kudos to him. Uh, let's see here. And I don't have an update for the other time zone uh, stag meeting, but uh, maybe one of our illustrious co-chairs, who I see is on the call now, uh, would like to say something about that. Thank you for the uh, generous in, uh, introduction. Um, yes, there has been a little bit of confusion. Uh, uh, apologies to Tilo and, uh, and the flat car team for um, how our scheduling has gone. We've been through and updated the, um, or, or it's, it's in flight, the, the PR is in flight, the relevant timing um, portions of the readme the the calendar still needs updating as well but thank you for bearing with us as we have uh, modulated through the cadence and sequence that we schedule these meetings on um there has been so much going on on the issues uh, i agree that a, a lot of it is closed off um i know we were due to have a 
w one of the foibles um, of that was that we were uh, we expected to see the Tetrate Zero Trust architecture um, uh, presentation from Jack Butcher, uh, Zach Butcher, excuse me. Um, that's that was in the other time zone. So um, the individuals who who came here for that and that were interested, uh, that happened on the fourteenth um, last week. Uh, and that I think was the, uh, the the majority of that session. Um, there has also been a presentation from Ada Logics on the fuzzing work that they've been doing for the Linux Foundation. So um, it, it's a uh, it, it's a small team there who have um, had a massively uh, disproportionate effort uh, and impact rather to the size of the work. Um, they've gone through and fuzzed a, a lot of core uh, critical projects. Um, they're using a lot of infrastructure provided by uh, the CNCF and, and by extension some other organizations and yeah uh, finding a huge number of, of bugs and um, edge cases the upshot of that is that they will put some guidance on fuzzing into some of the work that we've done previously so we have the cloud native security white paper and instead of creating a separate document to, to describe their approach. They will create a subsection in there. Um, so that work is uh, is underway. It, it seems to me that they will add that and then ask for review. Uh, so that will come up. The issue number there is not actually top of um, top of keyboard, uh, but I will find that and drop it in uh, anon. There is nothing else specifically that I've got from the other meetings. So um, I'm happy to hand over to you again, Justin, or, or I can pick up from here to you. Um, yeah, I, I, that sounds really exciting. If there's anything they'd like to add also to the uh, security assessment book, I feel like um, there, there shouldn't be anything really as a primary action item, but if they have glanced at it and happen to have any thoughts about something or think that you know fuzzing deserves a mention in some area where it's not currently mentioned, then uh, we can kind of drop a tangential shout out. Um, so awesome. Yeah, that, that all sounds really exciting. Um, another quick update on something else that's relatively exciting that's going on um, is that uh, the, a lot of the stuff related to security assessments and things is starting to move again in a reasonable way. Um, there were a bunch of issues before, one of them being that uh, people weren't in the right time zone and the people that were in the right time zone maybe didn't have a lot of the expertise. Uh, but Andreas has also stepped in and um, looks like he's going to also be helping in that direction too, which I think is a big positive step. Um, having one facilitator, which is the role that I was in before, is really difficult. Um, because you very quickly become the bottleneck for basically everything in the process, um, except for the chairs. The chairs are the other notorious um, bottleneck that you wouldn't expect. Um, but so there's some structural changes being made to make it so that the facilitators can uh, do things that the chairs are doing now to remove that as a bottleneck, and that the uh, there will be more than one facilitator um, along with the fact that in a week and a half, I'll be back in New York um, and on a more normal schedule and able to attend the regular meetings. Those things should also all help with the cadence. Um, and you know, of course, including Andreas's uh, ability to pitch in and help out. So, uh, yep, that's most of the update I have there. I guess uh, one last thing is, is that We've had some slow contact from the Linux Foundation office that's supposed to be publishing the security assessment book. Not exactly sure what's happening there. Uh, so we may be looking into either prodding them some from the chair side, or maybe looking to, to um, uh, work with other contacts in the Linux Foundation, or maybe looking to just publish the book through a different means. I think all of those are very viable. So. Um, if anyone has any thoughts or um, great contacts or thing, ways to make this happen in a good way, uh, you know, feel free to chime in. You can either do that privately to me or um, post it in the security assessment book Slack channel 
or post it on issue 999, which is the uh, issue in the tag security GitHub. Okay. Um, so with all that out of the way, I think it's, in, does anyone else have another uh, item, uh, business item that we should discuss uh, at this time? Um, oh, yeah, sorry. One last related thing is, is um, we've also increasingly been having discussions about lightweight assessments versus going through the full process and things like that. And um, I think there's general support from everybody that each of those belongs in different areas. And um, right now, it seems to kind of be the case that uh, at least I've been trying to nudge projects that have gone through and done a full self-assessment towards the more heavyweight process because it basically they've done the heavyweight work. So we should do the heavyweight work to get them the best product out. And products that maybe haven't done that level of work, we can push them through a lightweight assessment process and where they can get some of the value and not have to strain as much. Um, so I think part of what is happening here with Tilo presenting flat car and other things is uh, maybe you can also talk about, you know, as you discuss this, where, you know, where you guys would like to go in that process and what seems appropriate. If it's a very security focused project, then we strongly encourage going through um, the full process. But if it's sort of only loosely related to security and not very critical if it's compromised and so on, then um, I think it's quite reasonable to to take the, uh, the lightweight approach. Uh, so with all that being said, I will uh, be very happy to learn and hear a lot about Flatcar. Hilo. Uh, thank you, Justin. Yeah, um, as you'll see soon from the presentation, I think the, the full process would be adequate for us because we're not just claiming to be a secure um, operating system and foundation, but we also uh, want to help others to secure their workloads. So let me just fiddle around with my, with my screen settings a little bit so I can still see you folks and present my stuff. Okay, all right. So you should see um, the front page of the presentation, is that correct? Okay, I get a thumbs up. Um, all right, so this is about the um, Flatcar Container Linux operating system. We aim to be a CNCF incubation project, and we've uh, we've started that process. As part of that process, we're here uh, to present a technical overview of Flatcar. Uh, so you folks get a solid foundation to actually dive deeper or or ask questions or determine our direction for the security review with us. Um, Flatcar is a reasonably complex project. It's a Linux distribution. Um, so I'll try to cover all of the components here. It's a pretty densely packed presentation. Um, I will optimize for throughput. Um, and uh, we can dive into any of the given uh, items at um, following the, the, the presentation. The goal that I have with the presentation with you folks today is uh, to gain an understanding with you um, and to provide uh, a basis um, that you can use uh, to have me explain individual parts or uh, dive deep with me together. So we'll, we'll look a bit into the uh, background of Flatcar, which is determining uh, many of the components that we use and many of the concepts that we use. Uh, we look at the core concepts then uh, and take a look at the operations. All of that is a bit security focused, but um, it's also uh, thorough and will, will give you a complete overview. We will make a brief um, excursion into developing flat car. Um, so the packages, concepts, um, reproducible builds and um, things we do there. We'll then discuss the limits of the scope, like what we see in our ownership and what we exclude from our ownership and um, wrap up with uh, the security considerations as we, as we perceive them um, in flat car. There's a bit of stuff in the appendix which didn't make it into the main presentation just to keep it, uh, keep it limited in scope. We have an uh, SLSA deep dive there with like a little bit of a threat analysis on the SLSA part of the project, uh, which might be useful 
but uh, I didn't want to go too deep in the main presentation. So if you're interested, that is uh, in the appendix. So let's get started. The Flatcar Container Linux project is a fully open source and minimal footprint, secure by default and always up to date Linux distro for running containers at scale. And um, the last part of this statement is, is particularly important if you want to understand the scope. Flatcar is only aiming at running containers. Um, it is not composable, it is not uh, extendable, it's just a minimal distro, minimal operating system. And that's what we aim to do. And this gives us a few security benefits. Um, so by default, we have a pretty minimal attic surf surface, and that's because we come with a very small footprint um, of all of the packages that we include and very, very few runtime services. Um, we can we aim at security operate, operate workloads, and we have a secure update process that will keep your deployments fresh from the operating system side. Uh, and secure and will make it easier to update to the latest security patch level. We have a secure build and release process. Um, so everything's nailed down there as well. Uh, components are reproducible and um, the, the process is described, understood and uh, secured. And uh, we have a security first development process with a dedicated security team that takes care of um, emerging and um, existing security issues. But um, let's take a look at the background concepts and operations first. So Flatka is a bit of a heritage. Um, we started as a friendly fork of CoreOS Container Linux um, in 2017, if I recall correctly. And CoreOS Container Linux, um, in turn, was derived from Chromium OS. So it, uh, it, it takes a few concepts from Chromium OS there. And Chromium OS is based on Gen 2. So Starting from the from the bottom, um, we always build our releases from sources entirely from scratch, if you want, like Gentoo does. Um, our operating system is immutable. It's shipped as a full disk image, and it is use it's using A/B partitioning in order to stage updates and to enable rollbacks. And uh, the updates are distributed via a stateful protocol uh, called Omaha, and that's coming from Chromium OS. Flatcar includes, contrary to Chromium OS, a minimal set of applications and tools tailored to only run containers. No graphical user interfaces, no additional uh, add-ons, just the bare minimum. Um, and it uses declarative configuration that you write before you provision, and that is applied once at provisioning time, like CoreOS. That enables reproducible provisionings, and we'll come to that later. Um, we have a heavy focus on automation. Um, we have an SDK container that makes development accessible. Uh, it runs basically on all Linuxes that has uh, that has Docker. Um, it's a key element for, for our Salsa uh, conformance and the automation helps a lot with keeping the distro fresh and secure. Um, this automation in particular and staying fresh um, has been a major area of investment lately in the project. Looking at the technicalities of things, Flatka is distributed as a full disk image. And when you download that image uh, before you provision it, it'll have this layout. Um, so you have the basic um, booting bits, uh, EFI support, obviously, and there's a legacy BIOS uh, support. The EFI partition contains up to two kernel and init RD combinations. Those are binary blobs, which contain, contain both the kernel and the init RD. Those uh, two blobs correspond to one of two operating system partitions. In the partition table, you see them as USR. Those partitions are read only. You cannot write to those partitions at runtime. You cannot change the uh, operating system binaries. And they are DM Verity protected. So if you change any bits in the partition by force, um, you won't be able to use the operating system anymore uh, because the DM Verity hash um, fails. We have um, separate partitions for OEM support. Uh, for instance, if you deploy on Azure, you need a certain tool set. If you deploy on AWS, um, you need SSM agent. And that thing is um, stored vendor specific. So you download a specific vendor um, image for that. And uh, only that specific vendor image contains the respective vendor tooling. Uh, and lastly, at the very end of the partition table, you get your, your root partition. Root is read-write because users need to st uh, store the application somewhere. Um, at the initial provisioning, it's ex extended to span like the whole remaining of the, of the disk that you deploy on, and, uh, and that's that. Something that is um, pretty modern, very specific um, to Flatcar is uh, our slash etc directory 
is an overlay FS um, and is backed by a read-only directory and user share flat car ETC. That's the lower deer. And ETC itself is the writable upper deer. So any changes a user makes to ETC for custom configuration uh, can easily by uh, can easily be identified and diffed because the original um, shipped configuration is never changed. It's in a read-only directory that is below the actual ETC. And then we have your regular um, mount points that you have, uh, your temporary transient mount points that you have on all Linuxes, shared memory, uh, slash one media, tempfs, and dev obviously is dev tempfs. So you got your device nodes to work with. The initial provisioning and boot process is interesting because um, it's very specific to the way Chorus and Flatcar container Linux work. Um, so you configure your instance, like what disks to use with what file systems and what mount points, what users to create, which SSH keys to, to allow uh, to connect to the instance, what kernel arguments to use, all of those basic operating system um, settings, what services to start. Um, you configure that in a, in a declarative uh, YAML configuration beforehand. That YAML is compiled to JSON, and JSON is consumed by the instance during, provis during initial provisioning. And at that point in time, uh, your instance is set up. Anything else um, you should use a um, control plane for or custom automation. This makes deployments, this makes provisionings reproducible. You take the same config. Um, you provide it, uh, you, you provision that at any given point in time, you will always end up with the same node configuration. And that's, um, that's a safety and security feature for workloads that run on Flatcar. Now, the boot process um, is responsible for ensuring that um, the operating system partition uh, partition's integrity is okay. Uh, and that works with grub um, loading one of the two configured uh, kernel and init ID combinations. In that kernel and init ID blob, um, you have the DM Verity hash for the respective USR partition uh, printed in. So that's part of the initial um, provisioning image and that is part of every update. So every kernel and init ID corresponds to exactly one um, slash USR partition where all of the operating system um, resides. So grub boots, boots that, um, and then uh, the kernel boots um, initializes, it boots the init ID in the init ID, um, slash USR is mounted, slash root is mounted, the ETC overlay is mounted, and at the point where slash USR is mounted, the whole DM Verity magic uh, happens and ensures that um, the OS partition is, um, is has valid integrity. All right, and then the init ID pivots root um, uh, into the actual root, and then the, the, the regular startup um, continues. If an update just happened and grub reboots after an update, it rebo reboots into the new, the updated partition only once. Um, and uh, so the, the partition is not set as the default boot partition. In fact, user space is responsible after that first boot to set the known good flag to that partition. So this, so this booted uh, into in the future. And that's how rollback works, right? So if um, an instance crashes up after an update, or if some um, odd things are going on during the boot process, then user space never sets the same flag, the instance reboots again, and you have rolled back atomically. Talking about updates, um, Flatcar in, contra in contrast to um, basically any Linux distro I know of uses a stateful update protocol, the Omaha protocol, and it uses AB partitioning schemes um, for staging updates atomically, activating them via uh, reboot and the same for rollback, uh, rolling back atomically. And that's inherited from Chromium OS. The update payload is a signed binary. It's a single blob and it contains the image of the USR partition, that is the complete image, no diff, um, the new kernel and the new init ID. And that's all a single blob. Um, the uh, update is downloaded. It is validated against a, a signature that is in, encoded into the binary. It is staged in the inactive partition. And after that, um, the instance can be rebooted. 
Now, talking about reboots that can be pretty intrusive for workloads, so we offer a variety of options um, that you can take in order to uh, orchestrate those reboots. What you see here in the picture is just a simple single node um, installation. So update engine, which um, checks for the update um, and then does the fetching and validating. After the update is successfully staged, it will request a reboot by an internal service called Locksmith. Locksmith can be configured to use reboot windows, maintenance windows, whatever you want. Um, and it will eventually grant the uh, reboot access to, to update engine and update engine will then reboot. It will activate um, the new um, operating, the new version. And uh, after activation, that's pretty unique. It'll actually report success uh, to the update server. So we have a good idea of how new um, uh, new releases do in, in the wild. It will also report errors. So if the node encounters an error during update, that will be uh, communicated to the update server as well. Locksmith can do more than that. Um, so if you have a um, customized flat car uh, cluster, it's rare these days, but uh, and it was way more common um, in, the, in the past uh, because everybody's using Kubernetes nowadays. But if you so desire, um, you can orchestrate reboots uh, over a, a cluster of flat car nodes using etcd. So Locksmith can be configured um, to use a certain etcd group, um, which all flat car nodes will register to. And as soon as um, Update Engine um, contacts Locksmith for an update request, Locksmith will try, it, uh, try to acquire a etcd lock uh, and only after having the, this lock granted, um, it'll grant the re reboot to update engine, and then the whole thing uh, goes on as described in the previous picture. Now, this way you can uh, configure uh, staggered rollouts, like um, only reboot n nodes at a time, and other uh, finer granular items. Lastly, um, if you run Flatcar, if you run Kubernetes on Flatcar, then uh, which is pretty common nowadays. Um, we don't talk to Locksmith at all. We talk to a separate service um, that is the Flatcar Update Agent, which is a daemon set, if I recall correctly, that is um, spread to the node. This comes with, um, with an operator, a Kubernetes operator. And the way this works is um, Update Engine requests its reboot, which will uh, cause the Flatcar Update Engine to label the respective node with an annotation uh, reboot required. Um, Fluo will then drain the, this node, uh, and only after the node is drained, it will label um, with an annotation reboot OK, which will be picked up by Update Agent, which uh, will then allow Update Engine um, to issue the reboot. And then again, after successful activation, um, success is reported back to the update server. Um, it is worth to know that in, in all of these pictures, the update server only ever uh, is concerned about updating metadata. It doesn't serve the actual update uh, binaries. Those are served uh, from an HTTPS server. And the update server merely um, communicates the URL on where to fetch a certain update to the update engine. Talking about the update server. Um, this is a free and open source implementation of the Omaha protocol on the server side. Um, it is part of Flatka, the Flatka Container Linux project. So basically part of this presentation as well. Um, it's a pretty generic Omaha present presentation uh, implementation though. Um, it is nothing in there is Flatcar specific. So it could be used for other projects, but it currently is not. Uh, Flatcar is the only user of that project. And um, we share a large number of maintainers with, the, um, with, the, uh, upstream, with our Nebraska project. Um, so, Omaha is a stateful update protocol. Um, both the server as well as the client will be in any of those states at any given point. Um, so they'll either be a, a, idle or they will run an update check right now. Uh, they, after that, as a result, they might have uh, gotten an update granted, which they will then download, verify, install. Then they will need a reboot. And after that, they will have completed the update. Those states you can, you can introspect uh, on the server. So the server can give you insights into your operating system version spread because the node that checks in also reports the version it's currently running on. Um, it'll, it'll tell you about update uptake, uh, so the speed in which an update spreads in the fleet. 
Uh, and, and that's interesting, um, if, if you're uh, maintaining a Linux distro, it will also signal you update failures. So you will get feedback uh, on whether you broke anything out in the wild and maybe want to reconsider to stop the update. And that's very valuable for us. The server supports rate limiting, staggered rollout, custom, custom instance groups, and a lot of more features that we don't actually use in the flat car project. Um, you can absolutely operate your own uh, Nebraska server. As I said, it's a free open source project. Um, and it's operation is pretty uh, straightforward of that. You could even configure um, our main open source uh, community update server as an upstream server, and you could just receive upgrades from, from, from there and then just orchestrate the spread in your own group. Oh yeah, so we have insights into, oh, there was an error in this slide, sorry. You have uh, insights into version breakdown, um, update progress, and most important in, into um, errors clients may, may encounter. So Nebraska is your pretty much off the shelf uh, Go web app. Um, it uh, provides an HTTPS endpoint that um, instances can use, uh, update engine on instances uses to check for updates. This uh, access is unauthenticated, so basically everybody can come by and ask for an update using that endpoint. Um, the backend is written in Go, the front end is written in, uh, in TypeScript. The web uh, graphical user interface, which is used for, for managing updates uh, and for adding new updates, that is uh, authenticated via OAuth. And uh, for the for the actual um, flat car community update server instance, only a subset of the maintainers team has access to that, and it's configured via a GitHub uh, team in in a GitHub org. So it's pretty straightforward for us. Um, the open source update server instance runs on AWS RDS, um, so it's very easy to scale it up or down depending on. Um, on the load on the on the update server, and uh, we have an ELB in front, which gives us some basic DOS protection. Um, we've never run into into serious issues with the update server though. Um, talking about updates and releases, um, that is pretty exciting uh, because it has been in the focus of um, a lot of automation work that we've been doing in the last years, actually. Um, so flat car releases, like uh, any other uh, Git. Um, any other application that has its its, um, its sources in Git, uh, it, it basically works with branches and tags as well. So we have a main branch. We have a main branch in our um, distro repo. The distro repo is called Scripts for historic reasons. You'll hear that a few times in the in the presentation. And um, that is where all the major package updates happen uh, and all the major feature work happens. Now, from that, every two to three weeks, we create a new branch, which then is a new major release. That branch at first will be released as an alpha. Alpha, as I said, is roughly released every two to three weeks. Um, and it's usually a new major uh, alpha release. It's considered okay, so it won't explode uh, because it needs to pass all our tests, but it may contain incomplete features. So for, for actual operation, alpha isn't really um, useful. Um, after a feature is feature complete, um, we issue a beta. So it's further down the same branch. Um, it, things get a beta tag um, and betas are released well between uh, it, new made, major beta is released well between one or two months. Um, it's um, it's maintained for a while until the next major beta is released, uh, and that is interesting. So you can uh, we we will uh, patch level update and fix bugs um, down the release branch um, as long as uh, a release branch is alive. So we can issue issue minor updates, bug fixes, and security fixes. Um, to something that has been branched from main uh, without the need to like bump all of the of the packages in, into new major versions is which is happening in main. Um, and then after some time of um, of uh, soaking, so we we recommend users to run a few beta canaries in their deployments because beta is considered stable and feature complete. It runs. It also uh, has passed all of our tests, our full test suite. 
Um, and it can prepare users uh, and their respective edge cases, uh, uh, can prepare them basically uh, to what's, what's coming down um, the stable release. Now, stable is um, a release branch that has been fully tested, is feature complete, and has uh, spent some time in uh, canaries of, um, of larger deployments. And um, so roughly every second beta major release gets stable, um, which brings us to a stable release cycle of every two to four months, roughly. Um, stable are maintained as long as um, there is no new major stable release. So stable also really uh, um, receives patch level updates every two to four weeks, depending on uh, the need uh, for fixing bugs and for uh, addressing security issues. So what you're looking at here, um, all of those builds happen on a private infra infrastructure, which is hosted on an Equinix metal. All of the builds always build entirely from scratch, um, which gives us uh, the benefit of, of adding Salsa provenance. Um, the release images are signed on that private build infrastructure, um, which uh, has a strong access restriction as VPN protected. Um, so only a few of the maintainers can even access that infrastructure. Um, the releases are copied from that, pushed from that infrastructure directly to our uh, release servers, which also are an Equinix metal, so basically next door. Um, the update payloads um, are specifically sensitive, and that is because you can impact live fleets, right? So the update payloads are signed manually by a flat car maintainer. And um, there are only three maintainers currently uh, in possession of a respective HSM token that can do that. They would download the payload. They would verify the integrity of the payload um, based, on the, um, based on the release image key. And then they would sign um, with a what, what we call the update key um, in an air gapped environment and only then they will upload the um, signed update tarball and the signature, which is, as I uh, mentioned earlier, encoded into the update payload um, to the update server. They will then update Nebraska, and uh, that is how the update um, spreads. Uh, Justin? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. I have a bunch of questions, but I have a quick one here, which is that are, are all your updates signed with the same key? Um, as long as uh, this key isn't outdated, so we refresh every key um, every year. So there's annual refreshes of the key. Um, and we have ways to spread that basically to, to the fleet and have it soaked in. Um, but as long as the key is valid, there are only two keys that are important for, for Flatcar. First is the, um, the image signing key for new provisions. And that's on the, on the private infrastructure. And the second is the update signing key. And that's on the HSM token. So those, those keys are valid. And that, that's what we use for signing. Does that um, answer the question? Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, Jack. Hi. Um, so with, you mentioned once the, the thing is signed, uh, it's essentially modified to, to have the signature kind of in in it um kind of what were the reasons for doing it that way rather than having like a an artifact and then a separate signature that corresponds to that artifact um, and that is something that that is something that uh, enables us so the the update payload um also contains multiple things right um so it's a tarball that has kernel and init id as well as the usr partition in it and that thing is, um, the signature is actually woven in using protobuf. And that is um, part of the, of the whole Omaha protocol. So it's partially based, uh, it's partially done uh, like that because it's based on the, on the protocol. And um, it also kind of uh, makes it easier to spread an update, right? Because you don't have to deal with multiple files. You just have the single binary um, that you can put somewhere um, and uh, that has the integrity check more or less built in. OK. Um, is, it, is it possible from that like final result to like work, work backwards? Because like, I'm trying to think about if you wanted to build all of this uh, once, and then you want to build it all again, 
So you now got two artifacts and, and maybe they're reproducible. Um, and then, you know, one of them has been signed uh, and you've got now your modified artifact. Can you kind of work backwards from that one and be like, okay, there, there was, you know, the original thing was reproducible and then we signed it and now it's different. Um, that's that's not quite how the reproducibility works in in Flatcar. There's only there's only basically from upstream to downstream. Like yeah, after you produce an artifact and modified it, it's it's kind of it's considered broken. Um, you would need to go the same process in order to reproduce it. But um, that's actually a nice segue into the next and uh, almost last section before the wrap up, and that is development. So. Just taking a step back from the from the um, reproducibility and signing, which we'll talk in uh, talk about in a few slides. Uh, looking at Flatcar um, as a, as a distro, we have less than 500 software packages overall, which is pretty small for a distro that ships its own SDK. Um, there are less than 300 packages in the base OS, and that of course this uh, includes core libraries like the C library um, and the kernel and everything. And um, there are uh, 255 packages um, in the development container, which is something that you can put on top of a running flat car uh, in order to build extensions for that flat car. For instance, custom kernel modules. We use that for GPU support. Um, and there are 500, uh, 412 packages used in the SDK. Uh, and they have an overlap, right? Like almost everything that is in the base image also exists in the SDK. The SDK just adds tool chains. Um, most of these packages are reused from gen to upstream. And when we talk about packages here, it's not actual software packages that have binary bits in it. Um, people uh, a little closer to gen to development will, will know that gen to uses so-called e-builds. Now e-builds are kind of recipes, descriptions uh, of how to build a package. They contain all of the build configuration for any given package of any given version. So when I say packages, that is what I actually mean. Um, and that's what we get uh, most of our updates from. So we regularly sync our own um, eBuild tree with Gentoo, and um, we'll get uh, most generic uh, stability improvements and security fixes from there. We actually uh, collaborate a lot with upstream Gentoo on fixes. Um, we do things like package stabilizations for them, and we have contributed um, a number of package updates uh, to Gentoo Upstream. And then there's a number of e-builds um, for very specific flat car features that we maintain ourselves. And again, that's build descriptions, right? Um, and we also have a few build descriptions where we deviate from, from Gentoo Upstream um, because we have a good reason to. Um, so take important operating system components like the kernel and systemd, uh, where we want to track upstream releases directly before uh, we, we don't want to be forced to follow Gentoo's um, uh, speed here, but we want to you know stay up to date ourselves. So that is something that we would maintain ourselves. And then there are flat cut specific tools like Ignition, which does the uh, provisioning time configuration after burn, which helps with uh, vendor configuration in clouds or locksmith, which you um, have seen in the reboot orchestration slides. So those um, are maintained by us. Uh, and we usually follow in lockstep with upstream's latest releases. So you will always see um, the latest systemd patch level release uh, for systemd stable with Flatcar, or since we're using LTS kernels, ma mainly um, the latest LTS patch level release of the kernel that we're using. Um, you've heard about Nebraska as well. Nebraska is your know, Average off the shelf Go web app. Um, there aren't new features um, planned at this time, and it's in kind of low uh, low intensity maintenance mode. Um, so we just uh, keep updating the libraries and dependencies uh, in order to um, avoid security issues. And you've heard about the Flatcar Linux update operator, which is um, part of our reboot uh, uh, reboot orchestration with Kubernetes. Um, there are also no new features planned. Um, and although the cluster API project expressed interest in Fluo, um, so they are they are um, brainstorming about um, on node Kubernetes update, in place Kubernetes update, and in place operating system update. And they've been looking lately into Fluo uh, to see 
if Luo can help them there. Um, if they decide to extend it, then there will be new features in the Fluo project. Our core development concept is um, our, our builds are stateless and reproducible. Our, our um, distro repository always um, contains the, the full state. So it's always self-contained. Um, our builds are always from sources um, and the build always uh, results in an image. Like you, you won't get parts of Flatcar or individual bits of Flatcar that you can replace on an instance. There are no packages, there's no package manager. Um, this allows us uh, to record the full SASA provenance for every single packet that um, is being built and that ends up in the operating system image. We fingerprint incoming um, sources, we fingerprint um, the uh, package build configuration, and we fingerprint the output. Um, and that is our SASA provenance. The SASA um, JSON files are part of the operating system image, which again is signed. So um, you can look at that in the, in the live images. Um, and um, the integrity is secured because the, the whole um, image is DM Verity protected as well as um, signed with the update key. Yeah. Um, the SDK container is a full featured self-contained build environment. You can use it on any Linux distro that has Docker. It has even been successfully used uh, on the Windows subsystem for Linux. So if you so desire, you can absolutely develop and build Flatcar on, on, on Windows if you like. The versioning, like after, uh, the, the respective major and minor releases um, correspond uh, to um, artifacts in, in, in our distro repository, which I uh, said is called scripts for uh, historic reasons. So each branch of, a, of, a, um, of an active uh, maintained major release is, well, is a branch in the repo. Each, each release is a tag. Um, the main branch you can think about as alpha next, and every single version is branched of that specific branch. The branches are self-contained, include all of the information to run a build. You don't parameterize builds in Flatcar, you just start a script. Um, but let's look at how this looks. For instance, um, alpha 3619.0.0 um, recently released one and a half weeks ago. If you wanted to reproduce that build, you clone the scripts um, repo, you check out the tag, you run a single script which starts the SDK container and then within the SDK container, you run build packages, build image and image to VM, um, which gives you vendor support. And in this case, you will end up with the uh, AMI release uh, reproduced. That is also the AMI release for alpha 36.19.00. There are limits to the uh, reproducibility here and that is um, the bit by bit uh, that is the fact that um, images aren't bit by bit identical. So during compilation, um, compilers uh, build in transient information like the build host, um, the build time and other things. And that will lead um, to, well, a different output. Um, the executable parts of the images will be exactly the same. Uh, you will even, so since the scripts repo also records the uh, SDK version, a release has been built with. You will be using the exact same tool chain um, to build uh, this, uh, this release. Security processes and S uh, CVEs, I've claimed that, uh, Jack, yeah. Sorry, yeah, just one thing on the image. So do you occasionally um, analyze it with Diffoscope or do you just kind of accept that, you know, there's, there's gonna be some differences we don't need to kind of look at them regularly in, in fact in fact um since since flatcar is very um uh very small footprint we in fact look at the file changes for every single release so we look at what what files changed um and if we see any notable um change or difference from the previous release we usually investigate uh and see what what actually changed Cool. But I mean, like, so when you build the uh, when you build the flat car image, do you run uh, do you run Diffoscope or anything to no. like analyze the image? Okay. No. So um, this this happens before the image is wrapped up. So um, at the right. at the later 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 stage of the build process, um, 
all of the Gen2 eBuild packages um, will be installed into a um, and actually a mounted partition of a file system image, which exists as a file. Um, and then we'll run a few statistics on that and a few sanity check checks on that, uh, which will later be the, the Flatcar USR um, operating system um, partition. So that includes um, file sizes, file count, and those diffs um, are reviewed by maintainers um, for, for each release. But it's not it's not a binary diff on on the binary resulting image um, because that would be hard to introspect. Uh, make sense? Yep. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, I claimed that uh, we are security first. We have a security first development process. Um, we are very proactive there. Uh, we actually have a security task force which is formed um, from the from the flat car maintainers group. Um, and that uh, actively pursues um, both known and uh, emerging security items. We mainly focus on CVEs, um, but we also consider uh, issues that are not tracked uh, in the CVE trackers. Um, we are part of, um, we're subscribed to um, a number of non-disclosure lists. Um, so we actually get um, non-disclosure information upfront and uh, we will act on that if Flatka is affected. Um, our security team kind of has uh, determined somewhat of an, of an on-call process for themselves, which doesn't mean that there's 24-7, um, that, that there's a 24-7 on-call, but for each week, um, you have a rotating role of a primary and a secondary. And those folks are um, expected to actively look into issues that exist to um, actively scan sources like the security email lists, um, GLSAs, uh, which is Gentoo's um, security uh, tracking system and other distro security trackers for new and emerging issues um, and involve the other maintainers as they see fit. They're also expected um, to deal with existing issues. Um, if a PR solves a security issue, um, it is Part so kind of a kind of a read me on that as part of the PR that is picked up by our release automation and um, the list of CVEs fixed is uh, part of all of every release notes. Also in our mailing list, um, together with the release notes, we have like an extended uh, CVE report which also includes the uh, short summaries of all of the CVEs um, that are fixed by a certain by by any given release. All right, so. I mentioned that Flatcar is based on images and um, a full scratch, uh, and, and we do from uh, uh, from sources built for every release, um, and we do full testing. So our average round trip time from a patch for security issue is available, and um, our builds are ready and staged is between uh, 24 and 48 hours. This um, this ensures that um, the the update doesn't break anything on the receiving end. Some things we don't care about. Oh, I need to hurry. I have five minutes left. Um, so if you think so, about... Sorry, to, Go sorry to interrupt you, though. I, I think um, it's probably worth taking the last five minutes just to talk about uh, scope. I think yeah. also it's been, it's been a great presentation. Um, I think we need to run into another meeting because there's there's so much content here. Um, and thank you for all, all the depth and detail. Absolutely. Um, happy. Yeah. I, I wonder if we can... Um, maybe capture some questions in the <laughs> nice finish um if, if we can capture some questions in the document uh which will give them some time to gestate and, and come back and have an, another synchronous call to uh to discuss them because i, I know yes absolutely the yeah. appendix absolutely and... makes a lot of sense but yeah uh it, it i mean it feels like you've done a lot of the work here that would be needed for a self-assessment so if you write it up in that format and get that together, then we'll put the team together and we'll start giving you all these types of questions. It sounds like Jack is already volunteering to be on the team um, and I'd be happy to as well. So I, I don't think we'll have a hard time getting people together that want to participate um, in this and we can do this in a more structured way that uh, gets you out in proportion to the effort you put in, which has been considerable. Um, I've started 
a draft of the self-assessment following the template. It is way not done. It's maybe I'm even just halfway through the um, uh, the items listed in the template. That document is here. I posted in the chat, but I'll also add it to the. Um, okay. Just just let us know when you're when you're ready for it, and then we're happy yes, to dive in. Uh, in in the meantime, actually, I would I would actually uh, already encourage you um, to add your questions maybe at the bottom at, at, of of the document. So it's great to actually you know work that in, and maybe I can address address a few things. I will I will add a new section at the end of the document that says so you have your own page basically. Here we go. And um, yeah, so you have the link to presentation to the, the link to the um, to the doc as well. Uh, go wild. I mean, make make me explain anything. Um, I don't know which uh, which meeting works best for you. Should I should we should we reiterate on that in the um, in the next Wednesday's meeting, or uh, do you want to rather have a two week cadence? Uh, so we're back at, at this uh, EMEA time slot. Um, I think it would be strange to have it have you jump into something with a set of participants who most of them haven't seen this. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, so I would say that two weeks is probably better. Perfect. Um, yeah. Unfortunately for me, I'll most likely not be on that call, but um, I will watch the video and and uh, we can start the process. And hopefully, the self assessment and stuff will be together then. So in two weeks, yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. It that should be that just should be in good shape. I mean, I started working on the self assessment only early this week. Um, and I've, I've come that far, so I think um, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, in the meantime, if you have anything, any feedback, uh, please just add it to the doc or reach out to me via Slack. Um, I'll make sure to address that in the follow-up meeting. So when you're not there, you can, you can actually see it in the recording. Thank you very much. It just bears repeating perhaps that um, th this is the second presentation. There are some notes from the first presentation also in the meeting document for anybody who, who wants to catch up there. And huge thanks to Marco for taking such detailed notes throughout this presentation. They're, they're really excellent. Um, right, much appreciated. Uh, again, really excellent presentation. Um, makes it very easy to consume uh, a very wide uh, scope of, of subject matter. Um, any any closing remarks from anybody else on the call? Right, with that, the very happiest of Wednesdays to everybody. Thank you again to the Black Car team and Tilo in particular, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for taking the time. Bye, folks. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.